you know, a lot of people, that's how they're getting their, their podcast now. They, they go right to, to YouTube. Yes. They pop it up on their television. And oh, yeah. That's how they listen. And uh, not, yeah, for me, I don't. I listen to a ton of audio. Me too. And, and I, but it's always, you know, I'm doing the dishes, I'm sweeping outside, I'm right. working in my shop. Right. I'm, you know, I can't, I can't write and listen to, I can't write and listen to music when somebody's singing. Interesting. Because I can't write when I listen to music that I like. That's, yeah. There's other memories and things attached to those and your mind wanders. Yep. Yeah. I like to listen to like what I'm into right now when I write is ambient japanese acoustic mm. which is a thing you can find so easily on spotify yeah. and i, mean, I don't know if that else. would take me to some kind of different level of you know meditative because music will do that's, that to me sometimes. that's kind of where i'm at, what i'm after yeah but i put it in the background i i, I turn it down really loud. yeah yeah the same thing i can't have it too loud yeah i just want that to take away any other audible yeah. distractions can you so you probably can't do this or you don't do this can you sit in a busy like starbucks yes. right so i can too i find that somehow works yeah for me maybe yeah. because it's just a variety of noises i yeah. don't know i don't do that when i'm at home but when i'm traveling i do yeah so i'll bring my my macbook with me and write um but uh but, you know, it's true. I mean, when I do have a distraction at home of some sort, I'll just throw it in my backpack and go somewhere. Yes. You know. Yeah, I, I find, I did that in medical school too. It was, I found it easier to be in areas that had lots of movement and noise. Yeah. I think because I just want to at some point stop and look and do the thing and then let my brain rest and then go back yeah. to it. Yeah. It doesn't take long to get into a some kind of a groove. You know, it's just like meditating, you know, you, 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 you got monkey mind and <laughs> you can't, you, 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 you can't get the words out of your head. Yeah. And it's funny for a writer is that you're dealing in words and you still want to get to a space where you're concentrated and you're dealing with just what you're dealing with and nothing else. And, uh, so there's tricks that kind of music helps for me. You know, a lot of people smoke pot. Or something and i used to but i don't do that anymore. yeah that seems like that would wipe you out a lot of painters do it you know a lot of none of mine a lot of musicians <laughs> none of yours. i don't think yeah they do, or they don't tell me yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. but but so but it's it's something that gets people there and yeah well you know um what's his name bill maher just apparently yeah likes to yeah. partake and let his mind but you know i've seen him do the one that you he does one that's after hours and right. you can tell he's high yeah i don't like listening to that one that much no well because it's not as good no you know and there's a lot of he needs goofy that frontal, chuckling yeah and, he needs that frontal lobe much. working i think actually that's true you know it's true and i think i do as well and that's why i've stopped i stopped a long time ago um uh, smoking pot because i that's what happened. I, and I stopped being a good communicator with people. And I frankly, I just wanted to, I knew that I could get there as a, as an artist um, without it. Yeah. You know, but I tell you, was on, did a lot of great adventures while I was high <laughs> creating. <laughs> By the way, we have Michael and you say Brainerd. Brainerd. Yeah. Brainerd, yep. Michael Brainerd on. And so, it's like it should be a fun, really interesting podcast because you're the only guest I think that I've had that's a, had done a professional podcast yourself, which we're going to talk about the yeah. Honey Pile podcast, uh, which I listened to quite a few of the episodes. Oh, great! I think like four maybe oh, episodes, cool. um, and I kept thinking, wow, this is really just sounds like a movie almost to me. You know, it felt that not bad. That's a good thing, but. It was so different than what I do. Mm. It was like, this is a major production. Yeah, it was soundscaped. I had a sound designer. Um, all of that technical stuff, I I just got the right people in place. Mm. You know, I put the production together. I produced it. Um, and all of those people um, were put together. And I left them alone, mm. which is the most important thing. Mm. I told them what I wanted. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so you directed it? I directed it. Yeah. And I played Ernie. Yeah. I'm the yeah, voice no. of Ernie Pyle because I, I, I don't I, I don't look so. like Ernie Pyle at all, and nobody's ever going to cast me. Because <laughs> Burgess yeah. Meredith played him in the movie of his life. You kind of have a sensibility of what he looks. He was a good looking guy. Oh yeah. He sure. kind of was really a good looking guy. Well, he's dead, so we can yeah we can tell the truth. You know, he was no. Nah, there was something <laughs> about him that was captivating. I could tell. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you spent how many? How long did you? You started this 2017. This podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tell people what the name of the podcast is because it's out and you can yeah. walk, you can listen to it's 13 episodes it's the ernie pile experiment yeah you can look it up um right there from that title uh i did it with uh wfiu in bloomington indiana yeah which is on the campus of indiana university and it's where ernie went and um and that's why they got interested in it too, I oh, assume, they, yeah. right? I mean, there's papers were yeah. in Indiana and all that, right? There's a longer story about how it came to be there, but yes. Yeah. You um, mean his papers or this show? The, the show. But uh, all of his stuff is in the Lilly Library, Special Collections Library at Indiana University. Mm -hmm. So all of his letters and almost everything that he wrote. Um, wow. And so that has to be a lot of material. There's a lot. Because he's a writer. He wrote a thousand words a day, right? He wrote... Uh, yeah, six days a week yep. for uh, from 1935 to for 10 straight years to 1945 when he died. Mm -hmm. April, eight, the, April 18th. April 18th. And before the war, from 35 to 42, he traveled the States with his wife in a Model A. And he wrote, he was the first travel columnist in the country. Really? Uh, yeah. That's interesting. Widely yeah. considered that. And and that's what it's based on. Your podcast is those years, right? Not the war years. That's right. Yeah. That's right. The formative years, <clears throat> he and his wife going. And, and they had their issues. And his wife was, uh, she was uh, what they would call manic depressive now, but they had no distinction back then. Right. Uh, An al alcoholic too, alcoholic, right? Alcoholic, addicted to... Benzedrine and mm. uh, yeah, Benzedrine, which is the uh, speed, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so they were Bohemians on the road, right? Uh, very, very interesting people. And he, of course, is a, an amazing writer. Cut his teeth um, uh, in this style that helped him become the greatest war correspondent of World War Two. Maybe ever. Maybe ever. Everybody, all the correspondents that I've met since, uh, right. they all refer to him as what got them into it. Mm. You, know? you know, the amazing thing, though, is that nobody knows who he is that's young. No. It's like Roger Miller. You know, who's that? Well, he was a singer. Right. <laughs> At a comedy. And, right. But I bet very few people, say, 40 and under, know who Ernie Pyle is. Outside of Indiana. Outside of Indiana. And maybe Albuquerque. Albuquerque yeah, has Albuquerque. a, you know, he lived there and he has a house yep. or they turn it into a library, I think, yep. public library. They, yes. It's there in Albuquerque to go and tour and yeah. it's really cool. Uh, but he's this bigger than life figure, right? Yeah. For me, he is. Uh, and for a lot, for a of, lot people. of people. Well, he, he was in, <clears throat> well, okay, when he worked for the Scripps Howard newspapers. Mm-hmm. And so by the time he went to, uh, to war, uh, he was in 26 papers across the, the mm -hmm. country, all of the Scripps Howard papers. And by the end of the war, he was in almost every single newspaper mm. in the United States. Mm. There's a longer story about how that came to be. His, uh, his editor at the Washington Daily News, his home paper mm -hmm. in D.C., was Lowell Mellett, and Lowell Mellett was in the inner circle of FDR, mm. and he sort of ran um, the newspaper uh, uh, when they wanted to coordinate stories across the country mm -hmm. through the, I guess, was I don't know if the AP and UPI were around or whatever, but they would make sure that the same story was getting out back then, and he was in charge. And Ernie uh, and he were very close, and mm. so that was part of the reason why he, he was chosen as this voice to 
to tell all the people out there what their sons were doing during the war, what their right. fathers were doing, right. what their husbands were, were up to, how they kept their socks dry. Mm -hmm. You know, they weren't, he wasn't talking about what the battle was that just happened or what the troop movements are or what's going to happen right. next or what happened yesterday. It's the personalization he, of the dog face. That's right. Yeah. That's right. G.I. Joe, he invented yeah. the term. Yeah. And he was the only one that was allowed to use actual names of individuals, right? And he did. Yeah. He did that a lot. Which also personalizes it. Yes. Because you know it's a real person that's feeling this. That's right. And I got to, um, just this last year, this last spring, um, I was asked by Penguin Books to be the audiobook narrator of Brave Men, Ernie Pyle's book. Mm. They re-released it. And uh, that was re-released in uh, May 30th. So it's out there on Audible. Mm. And I'm the reader. Oh, that's really cool. Oh, it was one of the highlights of my career, absolutely. And was that because of the podcast, you think? That they go, this is somebody we should have because he partly. is Ernie? Yes, partly. Uh, because I was doing the podcast and, uh, I, well, it started with I written a play about Ernie. And it was in a, huh. a, a small college in, in Missouri. And this was in 2015, 16. And the... Uh, the, the the director of the Ernie Pyle Legacy Foundation, mm -hmm. Jerry Mashino, he got a hold of me and he found it on a Google alert. Uh, and he's like, what are you doing <laughs> there? And, I, and I'm like, oh, shit, he's going to shut me down. Mm. And uh, he didn't. He was just very kind. He just wanted to know what I was up to. <laughs> and he invited me to National Ernie Pyle Day in 2018. Uh, it was in Bloomington mm -hmm. and I went and I read two of Ernie's pieces there. And then lo and behold, after that, I was asked to be on the board. So I'm a director on the board of the Ernie Pyle Legacy Foundation. Wow. Yeah. And they, we control Ernie's, um, titles. Mm. And so Penguin came to us and asked, uh, if they could reprint the book. And we, of course we said yes. Why do you think they wanted to reprint it? There was another book that came out in the spring by David Christinger called The Soldier's Truth. Mm -hmm. and it's a bio, an Ernie Pyle biography, mm. which is a terrific book as well. And uh, I encourage anybody to go out there and mm -hmm. pick that up, read it. And uh, so they wanted to put out, they were putting that book out. They wanted to also republish. So that one's getting buzz, success, right. and they go, hey, we've got this in our own library. Let's yeah. redo it. Yeah. You know. And it's probably pertinent to today. I mean, everywhere we look is war, right? It, yeah. So. It's crazy. And it, is this, it always comes back. Yeah. It always has a way. And is the story back. that you uh, did the audio book for, is that about his war? No. Or is it earlier? What yeah. Is it? It's That's... about uh, he is on the road. Uh, it's a, it's kind of a sl uh, slice of life thing. of starts here. Ends here. It's thirteen episodes, and it's he and his wife traveling. No, I mean the book. The one, not. I'm not talking about your podcast. You're talking about Brave Men. Yes, Brave Men is all the war. Yeah, yeah. it takes place from Sicily. Yeah. to Anzio and and the I Italian campaign. Yeah, and then uh, England and pre uh, invasion of Europe. Yeah, um, Normandy, and uh, and all that, and into Paris, and then marching toward. Germany. Yeah, because he sees Paris liberated, right? He does. Yeah. Some really great dispatches there. I can imagine. Yeah. And he's also getting mighty effed up mentally, too, on these things. Big time. Yeah, I mean, he's yeah. having PST, PTSD. For yes, sure. yes. And that's the... Not only that, is he has achieved a level of fame in the Yeah, United he's got to deal with that, too. Yeah. The war was winding down in Europe. He uh, is asked by the War Department to go um, to the Pacific. Yeah. And he didn't want he to go, right? No, he didn't want to. Yeah. He, he was thinking about absolutely just quitting writing altogether. Um, who knows where his mind was? Because you're right, PTSD. He had seen so much death. Mm. He he wanted to open up a jewelry store in Albuquerque, in a Native American jewelry store. Yeah. That That's what he wanted cool. to do. Then he would have been on my podcast or somebody would have known him and we'd be talking about the yeah. jewelry component yeah wow where'd you find that out that's really cool oh i don't know i mean it's all where did you find out all your stuff about maynard dixon you know it's, yeah i people could call me obsessed 
I, I suppose I am. I suppose they call you obsessed with Maynard Dixon. Yeah, some words, other words even. <laughs> right? I mean, I could sit here yeah. and, and talk for four or five hours about Ernie and create stories for you, just like you do with, with Maynard. Yeah. So how did that happen? How did that quote-unquote obsession occur? Because well, this doesn't just happen overnight. When I discovered Ernie. And uh, when was that? How old were you when you did that? I was probably 24, okay. 23, 24. All right. And I was in New York City. I had just gotten a job on all my children as an actor, moved from LA to New York. And um, I wasn't working enough to really even pay my rent. I was, I had a contract mm. and I was making, I think close to a thousand dollars per episode. So that's an episode a day. So it's mm. a thousand bucks a day. Mm -hmm. And I was only working every three weeks once. Mm until I get ramped up into a storyline and then I'll, I would be working more. But for the first few months, it was really hard. And I contemplated getting another job. I, I didn't know <laughs> what to do. Um, and so I couldn't even go to the movies. I didn't have enough, enough money to entertain myself. So I would go to these used bookstores mm -hmm. and I'd find books for pennies on the dollar, you know. And I was, I pulled a book down off of a bookshelf in a in a old bookstore in Lincoln Center, and what came with it was sort of stuck to it as a book that fell to the floor, and that was a book, um, uh, David Nichols' book. Uh, it was a compilation of Ernie's pre-war writings, mm. and that's how I came to Ernie Pyle. I read his pre-war stuff before the wartime stuff. Did you know who he was before then? No. Yeah. And this is like early, mid 80s? 80, 89. So more late. And you're 30 ish? I'm early 20, 30s? about 24. Oh, you're really young. You're 24. Yeah. Uh, so you find, would you keep the other book that went with it? Did, no, I don't even know what that was. Yeah. But this one, do you think that was more than coincidence? Now I you, you can say yes, but I don't know. I guess then. I mean, I, I picked Seems it up and like I divine fell in love intervention with it. in a weird way. Yeah. But but there was a foreword to the book that described uh, his life with his wife. Mm. And I thought that was much more interesting than anything that I read that he had written. I've since, you know, uh, fallen in love over and over with many of his dispatches. I'm sure. Uh, but that was, I thought immediately, oh, this would be a great movie. Even at 24? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Because yeah. I had been writing back then. I was always a writer. Yeah. Do you consider yourself more a writer than you do an actor? Because, I mean, you did a lot of, you still do a lot of acting. It depends on what I'm doing at the time. You know, if yeah. I'm out in my shop working with wood, I'm a, I'm a furniture maker. <laughs> so so um, you don't categorize yourself as in one whole? I kind of do for me, I think, more than I'm like an art dealer. I don't think I'm a writer, yeah. but I don't think of that as my, my why I'm a Your primary. Me. Yeah. Right. I I I uh I made my bones first as an actor, yeah, successfully. Mm -hmm. Um, and then right now I'm having this writer's moment, uh, which I'm completely um, surrounded, embedded in, sunk in. You know, it's fun, huh? It's it is, <laughs> and it's hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever yeah. done. Every single time, sitting in the chair, looking at the blank page, is yeah. the hardest thing in the world. Oh yeah. But you're under control. You get to control the narrative. I would think in acting, you don't get to control the narrative so much unless you're the director or producer or whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's like, no, you, we need that inflection a little different on the word A, you know? Yeah. Yes. You're always giving in to someone else's creative impulse, or you have to. Um, and you're always, you have to wait for somebody to ask you to come work. Yeah. And when with writing, with woodworking, uh, with painting, yeah. is that you don't. Do you paint too? Well, I haven't in a while, but yeah. but I have done it. The creative impulse absolutely crosses over into anything you put your time into. Yeah, I, I agree the, with that. The, there's a lot of the <clears throat> same tenets apply. Mm -hmm. And and so I'm not afraid of any sort of creative endeavor yeah. like that. You just keep going until it looks good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> whatever you're working on or you're happy whatever as yeah, long or as you're, you're happy. happy yeah 
you can't let other people dictate if you're doing a good job or not. Yeah. In my opinion, you know, yeah. I write my books for me. People think they're not good. Well, you know, I'm sorry. I don't read them, but some people do. Yeah. So, but I still write them for me. I'm sure this Ernie Pyle was done a lot for you. Yeah. Yeah. I, when I first started uh, writing the, the, uh, the, the podcast, I call it a podcast, but it's an audio drama. It is. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's like a audible book of yeah. types. It's, it's it has multiple characters in it. Uh, and so, and then it leads up to a reading of one of Ernie's um, columns. Plus lots of noises and things that, yeah. you know, bring you to the moment of the setting. Yeah. Whether it's a car horn or whatever, dishes rattling. Yeah. Or whatever it you might be. You feel the atmosphere. Oh, absolutely. Right. That's really strong. Yeah. Yeah. And so when I first started writing it, after I got the deal, made the deal with the, it's an NPR affiliate station. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, make any money on these things? A little bit. It's not much. Right? A little bit. It, yeah. it all... This you know it's on it's on YouTube as well and so if it gets hits then I suppose there's some money but I haven't made any money on it not yeah. not I, I made my money on the the deal that I that I made before I started okay. which is what all independent filmmakers should do you know there's there's so many stories the 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 road to financial ruin is mm -hmm. is um, paved with people that have borrowed money from their friends and their family to right. make things and uh and hoping that oh i'm going to go to these festivals and then someone's going to come along and buy it and <laughs> right. it never works never yeah. works out yeah um, and so i think that's an important component for people to know yeah that when you do these things mm -hmm. and you started in 2017 you've been working on this a long time mm -hmm. that you're doing it for more than a monetary gain yes it helps to get it but oh yeah and you hope it does but I don't think that can drive you enough to do it. And clearly, if you, no, at least I wouldn't. Uh, uh, no, I I got really lucky. I wouldn't have done it had I not made this deal. Yeah. But I made the deal, um, and uh, and I got a chunk of change for it. And at the end, when we were finished, mm -hmm. I had some money left over for myself. There you go. But if if I didn't, it would have all gone into the project. Yeah. You know, which would have been hard. But I did get to pay my bills along the way, <laughs> and uh, and I had to, you know, financially incentivize some p other people along the way yeah. beyond the contract that we'd already signed. Yeah, because you have real actors in there too. It's not, yep, I mean, good actors, like really ones. Yeah. yeah, and you know, we had a great composer. I went to him and said, "I want a lost Aaron Copland symphony," mm. and he goes, "I can do that," mm -hmm. and he's a he works at, he's a professor at Colgate University and he's in some, some, uh, foundation, uh, of, uh, Aaron Copeland foundation. He's, he, it's yeah. just right in his and, wheelhouse yeah. and he did. And it, that music sounds like a lost Aaron Cop Copeland symphony. Yeah. And it really helps, you know, you, you listen to that without the music and you put the w music into it and it. It just puts you over the edge, puts yeah. a tear in your eye. Yeah, you have to have the music for what you're doing, I think. I mean, it's yeah. just... Cause that's it, what makes it like a film. I was going to say, that's what makes it cinematography, really, to me. It's mm -hmm. a cinematic event when you hear the music. Because, you know, you take music yeah. out of a movie, you know, well, you wouldn't even recognize what the movie is. Yeah, yeah. And it's a cheat. It's a cheat code. You is know, it? you put music onto anything and, and, you know, what do you want? Do you want somebody to feel anger mm -hmm. well i can do that do no, you want somebody true. to be unnerved right you know you think of the 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 psycho shower scene yes. right when you want somebody to feel swept up in emotion well john williams right yeah. i often when i watch a movie i'll listen to the music and i know what's coming you know i start tuning into the music and going okay this is where they're taking the the plot line just mm -hmm. from the music yeah, they're setting it up for you. Though you don't really, most people, you know, takes away a little bit from the music uh, from the movie if you do that. But I can't help it. It's like, okay, here we go, because you know, I want. I kind of like to think how it's going to happen in my head. Mm -hmm. um, and the best movies for me are the ones I can't visualize what they're going to do. Yeah, there's a 
there's a component to film that uh, the, I, I don't want to use superlatives like say the best way to, to <laughs> you can use to them. make a, a film is uh, it's it's widely considered to be a uh, a good way to make films is to to take out the dialogue to um, juxtapose image images to um, create story uh, a storyline for instance now this is the theory of Sergei Eisenstein great Russian uh, uh, director and theorist mm -hmm. film theorist but his uh, ideas of montage is is in every film school and that is okay imagine this first picture uh, fo photograph a uh, film strip uh and it's uh, a deer eating mm -hmm. and then cut to another image and it's a boot stepping onto the ground onto a stick that breaks mm -hmm. and then the next image the deer's head pops up yeah <laughs> well what did that do for you right you figured that's a story oh there's a gun there's deers being hunted right and that's just three separate photographs or moving images right. that create that without any any narration or anything. And the, there are a lot of films out there that do that so well, and there are filmmakers that do it well. Mm. Um, Carol Ballard is one of my favorites. The, the 20, first 20 minutes of uh, um, Black Beauty mm. uh, it, with... Uh, uh, gosh, what's his name? Anyways, the, it's all, it's a 20 minutes. There's not a word spoken. Mm. <clears throat> there's a lot of films like that. You'll see. And that is... Well, Dances with Wolves, when I think about that beginning scene of Kevin Costner right. going across, you know, yeah. and just, you know, people shooting at him and leaning back. And, yep. I mean, to me, that's that same kind of... That Civil War battle. Uh-huh. Right. Set it all up. It's It does. It sets up his character. Yeah. Uh, and in... In audio storytelling, is that you are doing th you all you have are the words, mm -hmm. you know. In in theater, when you're sitting in a watching a play, uh, that's all based in words. Uh, so there are other ways to get to that you know that magic where it's putting the images in your head for audio storytelling. So you are doing the same thing in Eisenstein's theory of juxtaposing images. The images you're juxtaposing for audio mm -hmm. are um, created by words. And it's the same thing that a book does when you're, when you're reading a book. Right, it's setting. Like you're, you have the image in your head of who Tom Joad looks like in Graves of Wrath. I have an image in my head of who Tom Joad. And everybody who reads that has, has their own image. And the cadence and the rhythms of how they speak mm -hmm. all made up in your mind. Yes. You know, I that's hear those the magic. voices for sure. Am I Correct. when I'm writing? Right. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's the magic of those. So each has its own, you know, um, magic storytelling magic. So anyways, I want to tell you mm. before we go too far in this, how far are we now? No idea. <laughs> that's the best part. Well, wanna... there is no beginning, middle or end. Yeah. There is just the arc. Yeah. So we're somewhere on the arc. I, I want to tell you, I, <laughs> I've listened to many, many um, uh, episodes of your podcast, and I want to tell you how much I've learned. Mm. Yeah, my guests are fantastic. Yeah, and yeah. learned about this, well, the art world, the the Southwest art world. Mm -hmm. uh, Maynard Dixon, uh, the last one I just listened to was about the the Pendleton blankets. Yeah, with Barry Friedman. Yeah. I know so interesting. Was he's world's expert. Yeah. <laughs> world's expert. Yeah, he picked Pendleton. one little area that he's just fascinated with. Right. And he's a comic, right? I mean, he's a world-class writer for yeah. comedy. Yeah. Yeah, he feel, you know, takes this one area and just goes, "Yeah, I want to be the trade blanket Pendleton yeah. guy." I think what you're doing is important. It's fun. I know. I just did one with people that own mines. It'll be coming up. Really? And I was like, oh, yeah. Like, you know, I don't know about mines. I deal in turquoise. Yeah. But I don't really know what it means to be a miner. Right. You know, to bring up the turquoise. 
Right. Just like, so for you, this is the podcast, right? You do podcasts and also acting and things. And all that's very interesting to me to find out how you made this podcast. Yeah. That's very intricate. And, and that, and again, in fact, let's just go to that. Yeah. So when you, when was it you go, oh, this is a podcast. This is a, you you said early on 24, I see a movie. Yeah. So 30 years pass. And now you see a podcast. And is that because, A, the, the media has changed, the way it's easier to do a podcast? And, I mean, getting a movie made, forget it, right? Well, I had first uh, written a play. And right. so I had approached it from a uh, sort of a it's, – it's a, it's a play based on the life of Ernie Pyle. So I can take license. Mm-hmm. I don't have to be, I'm not making a documentary. Right. Uh, and so when, when I was in Bloomington, Indiana for the National Ernie Pyle Day and I was rehearsing these and I memorized the two pieces. The of dialogue. Ernie's, the di- yeah, yeah, two of his stories. And um, one of them was the one about the wind, which is episode two of my podcast. Mm-hmm. I, I created a story around it. Uh, and so I was over at a friend's house who lives in Bloomington, and uh, she and I worked together on All My Children. Uh, and uh, she's her name is uh, uh, Greta, and uh, she's also in the movie Rudy. They're, they're having a new director's cut of Rudy coming out, mm. and all of her scenes are being put back in, which is mm. fantastic. And uh, Greta Lind is her name. And uh, so I was over in her backyard because Danuta was with me, uh, my wife, and we, I wanted to show her uh, fireflies. She had never seen fireflies. She's a West Coast girl. Mm -hmm. And so Greta says, come on over to our backyard. We'll have a fire. There'll be fireflies. And we did. She saw the fireflies. And I said, you know, we're out here having a glass of wine. I said, look, I've got to read these things tomorrow. Can I read them for you? Because I have audience in front of me, just a little rehearsal. And I read them. Well, lo and behold, her husband at the time uh, was the station manager at WFIU. And he says to me, he says, that was great. Is there an Ernie Pyle podcast? (laughs) And I said, no, there isn't. But I I, I think there should be. Right. And that's how it started. And I think originally for both of us, the idea would be me reading these Ernie Pyle dispatches. Right. And I went home and... I don't know how it got there, but I started writing in uh, 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 in dialogue between Ernie and his wife Jerry. That night. That yeah, as soon yeah. as I started, yeah. yeah, and that was uh, and I kept going and I go well I like this, mm-hmm. and then I came up with the idea that that we'll have one dispatch of Ernie's read at the end of every episode, right. but the episode will be how we got there. Right to to that point of him him writing the the piece and that's how it started and it took me thirteen episodes I wrote it took me over a year to write them mm. anguish utter <laughs> anguish well I think there's two reasons too you're also he's almost like a heroic figure to you mm-hmm. and that you don't want to let your hero down right that's right. So. That's right. And I'm speculating a lot about what his life was like with his wife. Sure, of course. Because there's not a lot written about her. Yeah. In fact, when he did write about her, he called her that girl who rides with me. Right. He never referred to her by her name because she didn't want to be a part of the the column. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. But she helped him. Oh, I mean, yeah. It sounds like she was quite a wordsmith and... You know, uh-huh. she had her dictionary with yes. her, and so she had listened to your podcast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She had that dictionary with her, held it like the King James Bible. Yeah, and uh, well, yeah. she probably recognized that words were so important to her husband, mm-hmm. and if she could have a mastery over this, maybe over him, that it gave her leverage in a way that made her relevant. Well, now you're getting in my head. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, um, I, I imagine that to be that way. Yeah, I even if it, it wasn't, we don't know. No, but I could see it. Yeah, because did he feel like he really wasn't a great writer to some extent? Yeah, right. Oh, for sure. Yeah, so 
you know, that gives her that ability. Yeah. And she, when he wrote his most famous dispatch, which is the, um, the death of Captain Wasco. Right. Uh, he, uh, he was riding home just prior to that, uh, the Battle of Monte Cassino, and he was writing to his friends at the paper saying that, I think I should give this up. I'm dead. I have nothing to give. My writing is terrible. Yeah. And then he ends up writing the piece that got him Pulitzer. the Pulitzer. Yeah. In 1944. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what, and, and uh, an interesting thing about the Captain Wasco is uh, with the Ernie Pyle Legacy Foundation, I just went down to Belton, Texas, where Captain Wasco was from, and his family is still there. Mm. And we set up... Uh, 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 Captain Wasco Day. This was in September, and uh, the you know they had state politicians there, mm -hmm. and it was in a an auditorium at the high school, and I got to get up there and read the Captain Wasco story. But before the day before that, I met the family, uh, and they all called him Uncle Henry, uh, and his 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 nephew asked me if I had ever read the the letter the final letter home that uh, uh that captain uh henry t wasco had written home and mm. i said no and i would like to and he gave it to me and i read this thing blown away mm. talk about ernie being a great writer mm -hmm. just this normal average american was a wordsmith mm. and everybody wrote well back then mm -hmm. you know it was part of our schooling and this was his letter that all soldiers going into battle are required to write home. Yeah. Because if they're killed, they, right. that letter is sent home. And that was his. And he wrote about why he uh, was a, a soldier and uh, decided to be a, uh, to, to fight for America. Mm. And it's moving. It was so moving. And I think I was the first person to ever read Ernie's story and that to a group of people mm. ever. Could be, I could be wrong, but. I think so. Probably not. It was it was an amazing time that day, and to you know, being on that foundation has led to so many different uh, cool things. Like like I last year I went to D.C. Uh, because I am working on the the complete works of Ernie Pyle, and I'm going through the microfilm of his uh, uh, newspaper mm. to find everything that he ever wrote. And it'll be like a 15 volume <laughs> piece. I don't know who will buy it. I'm certain certain that I'll have to self publish. So you're going to put all his writing? Every single thing that he Everything. ever wrote. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. In one place. It's going to take a long That's time. That's a lifetime. Yeah. It's a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Man, you're all in. Yeah. You're a writer. Yeah. That's what it is. I mean, because yeah. when you're doing that, I mean, because you're going to, it's not just going to be putting it in. You'll also be writing about right. the events. Yeah. And, I mean, you'll be a historian, really. You're gonna, yeah. Is what you're going to be. Yeah. I'm, I'm working on the second season right now of uh, uh, the Ernie Pyle experiment. And I use things that I find. Like I'm that. sure. I, and I'm not just relying on biographers. Right. That yeah, have your own done research. their own work. I'm, yeah. That's yes. the most exciting when you find those, I think. <clears throat> yeah. And so this is going to be another 13? Probably. Episode? Probably. And when will that come out? Soon. Like within the next... next I'm, Maybe the next year. Yeah. Yeah. Might be ready to record by next summer. Okay. And then yeah. once you start recording, how long does it take you? Yeah. I mean, that's a question. Yeah. You know, so let's say it's 13 episodes. What period of time does it take you to actually record and do those 13 episodes? Is it one a day? Half of one a day. Uh, no, it's it's we don't do it in in that order. We okay. have if we have multiple actors um, or an actors in multiple uh, episodes, we do all of their right. stuff just like a movie. At once. Just like a movie. Yeah. It took us seven days to do yeah. all of those and um, at those thirteen episodes. And once that's done, mm -hmm. I get to choose all the takes that I like, mm. put it together in a, a document. The editing part, which is the creative part. Yeah. And then we send it to a sound designer, and that sound designer puts all the wonderful little sounds in there. Yeah, I could hear. I was listening to try to figure mm -hmm. out how that was done. Yeah. And, uh, my uh, my co-executive producer, uh, he, he did all of the Foley, 
which is what they call recording sound effects. Mm -hmm. And uh, Russell McGee, and he put that together. And he was like essentially my uh, um, cinematographer mm. and technical whiz. Mm -hmm. Knows everything that I don't about doing that. So, yeah. And do you record in a sound studio? Yeah. Is where you do it? Yeah, we recorded it at the sound studios in Bloomington. And do you, the t actors, if when it's some dialogue, they're across from each other? Yeah, in the same room. Yeah. yeah. I would think it would help feed the ability to be in that moment in that part. Yeah. And my, my ignorance of the recording process caused a lot of problems. <laughs> because I would have, it was in episode nine, um, there was a party scene. Mm -hmm. And I had everybody in the same room. And they're talking over each other. Mm. And Russell is saying, this isn't going to work. It's not going to work. And I'm like, it's going to be fine. You can, you can clean it up in post, you know, that right. kind of thing. <laughs> and boy, he once he got to trying to separate the sound out of the microphones of that scene, mm. he was calling me and cursing and, yelling like and screaming. And <laughs> that's when I had to throw more money at, at him. <laughs> but what he ended up doing was... Um, he got the actors back in yes. and he had them listen to what they said yeah. and they said the lines exactly how they said them before. And he laid those all together yes. and it sounded better. Yes. I can we see sort that. of invented a technique there. Yeah. I wanted this cacophony of party argument. Right. So you, know? you have the party argument, but now with the laid over sound of the actual voices, you yeah. can you didn't have to pull it out from the right. cacophony. You can just lay it over the cacophony. Yeah. yeah. So and I'm they're learning, actors, so they can do it. Yeah. So I'm learning that, you know, I could have saved myself a little bit more <laughs> money in the end had I listened to the experts. The sound producer. But okay. at the same time, I don't think we would have ever come to the what we got. Yeah. Had, had we not happy, done it. Yeah. Happy accident. Total happy accident. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to start a little bit. I want to hear about your beginning because I don't want to okay. kind of understand how you got to where you are. And we really didn't haven't talked about that. I mean, we just like, oh, yeah, I was in a, you know, a, what do you call it? Uh, all of my children. No. All my children. All my children. Yeah. This my, I think that was my mom's favorite. So she, yeah. she, I probably sat on some chair watching her do her thing with embroidery while you were on TV. And yeah. I didn't even know it. So, but when you were a kid, where did you grow up? Uh, in in South Orange County, California, yeah, in okay. uh, Laguna Hills. Okay. Oh well, that was <clears throat> then was really kind of rural. It was right? very yeah, yeah. It was very different than yeah. it is now. And we had a cool little art community in Laguna Beach. Yeah, I know. And so I was always surrounded by it. Um, started uh, art lessons at the age of I think six in yes. some lady's garage oil painting going over there twice a week and uh, loving it so somebody probably your mother saw that you had yeah. an interest and said let me set this up yeah i guess so I, yeah my mom set it up um so my sister and i went and painted and so i started doing that a long long time ago learned mm. learned uh, just being six years old and and talking with somebody who can teach a six-year-old kid the concept of perspective mm -hmm. or, or the color wheel mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's and me, good. me eating it up mm -hmm. at that time. Like, wow, I never, I never thought about mm -hmm. depth uh, uh, and the vanishing point and things like that. So I've always been, uh, 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 I approach all of it you know, philosophically. Anybody wants to get into a sort of philosophical discussion about it, art or anything, I'm always there. Uh, and then, yeah, I, I uh, when I got into high school, started acting. Were you and still painting and doing art? Oh, no. You no, I, I remember there was a moment yeah. when I was sitting in front of my easel at home. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I don't know, I'm probably about 10, 11 years old. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know what to paint. Mm. I don't know what to paint. it, and, and I didn't want to push it. And I never came back mm. until much, much later. But I did eventually. Long in my adult years, but uh, yeah, I. But in 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 high school, I got into theater mm. and uh, and immediately knew that this is where I wanted mm. to be. You know, I'm a I'm an anti thespite myself. Mm. 
I don't like hanging around with actors. Mm. And, Why is that, you think? I, I don't know. I don't know. There's a... They, they tend to... Actors, <laughs> in a, you know, in, when they group, when they all get together, they they gets a bit clickish. And I've never... I'm a loner. I'm just a loner. You know? Um, but some of my best friends, actors, for sure. I just didn't... I didn't... I wasn't a part of the scene... Yeah, they'd be like, oh, I'm doing this, and, yeah. you know, what are you doing? And it's a comparison probably at some point. Yeah. Yeah. You don't see that in the art world as much, at least in my world. You know, it's not like, oh, he's getting this or doing this or getting that award. And, you know, it's more, it feels more like it's a collaborative kind of colleagues between artists in, yeah. in, in the Western world. That's what it feels like. But I could see it being that way. I could see it being that way in East Coast contemporary art, too. Where, yeah. you know, who's buying mine and what show am I having and, you know. I'm much more suited to being a writer, to be alone and yeah. being a woodworker. Yeah. I just love being alone and nobody has to tell me. Yeah. Uh, you can't do that. See, and that's hard for an actor, I would think, because, again, they always have to tell you what you have to do. You have no, you have little control, I would think. That well, that's where the those philosophical discussions come into play. When you get a director who doesn't like to talk about things, mm. it's hard for me. Um, but when I do have a director who does like to talk about things, I they can tell me what they want, and I can poke at at that mm -hmm. because I'm looking at the same text and they're coming up with something completely different than I I can see. Mm. That doesn't mean that I won't do it or that I won't like it. Um, but please help me get there. Yes. Let's talk about this. Um, I'll, I'll do this for you. But then there comes a time when the director's not there and you're in a play and, you know, you're in your third month of this play. Mm -hmm. You're like, I can do whatever I want now. And a lot, a lot of directors will just say, yes, you know it better than me now. Mm. Um, but I would think that's very different theater versus doing a movie or a TV. Sure. You know, where you do have maybe a little bit of that. Oh, Yes. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It, it, yeah. There needs to be long conversations before you start. Sometimes there's none. I would bet. Action. And, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of directors who their, their whole MO is let's just hire the best actor that we can get and leave them alone. Mm. Uh, and, and some people respond well to that. Most do. Most actors do. Some, some don't. Some need their hand held. And I'll tell you, sometimes I need my hand held yeah. as an actor uh, if I'm not fully grasping something. So, but I always want to get to a place where I've aligned the inside, the internal aspect of the character um, and perfect those things, the emotional world of, of the actor. Um, but sometimes it's not coming across and that's when the director will step in and say, say it like this. <laughs> hey, Spielberg does that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I bucked that for so long. But how do you buck Spielberg? Yeah. Have you worked with no. him? Yeah. No. 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 You probably wouldn't want to. Someday. Yeah. It's yeah. coming. Maybe as a Henry Pyle. I mean, Ernie Pyle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you're in high school, you do theater, you like it. Yeah. And so you go to college too. <clears throat> Well, or, right or, out of, because I lived, you know, right down the road from Hollywood. Right. I got an agent uh, as a senior in high school. Wow. How did, how'd you do that? I had a friend who had an agent yeah. and they set me up and I started to go up there and audition and sort of get to know what the landscape was there. Right. And uh, I didn't, I, I didn't get anything right out of, out of the gate, but I, a lot of experience and a lot of auditioning um, and went through a series of agents for the next several years. I went to Cal State Fullerton for a couple of years. Uh, I went to a college called uh, Pacific Christian College in Fullerton. Uh, it's now, I think, called Hope University. So I was there for a little while, contemplating if I was going to um, be a minister mm. or a missionary or whatever. Uh, and uh, I decided that uh, I really wanted to be an actor and I missed going up to Hollywood and auditioning and knew that I could start making money if I would concentrate on that. 
so I went to a school up there called the Lee Strasberg Theater Institute. Yeah, I know what it is. Yeah, so they teach the method. Right. Um, they're attached to the to the actor's studio. Right. And I learned all that. I learned that language. Yes. And it certainly is a language to learn. Yes. Uh, and I learned that, and it's predominantly the language of acting in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Um, and then one year I got I got a great agent who was who championed me along, mm-hmm. started working, and one of the first things I got was uh, all my children. And I was auditioning with you know big actors that you know i remember going on many times on auditions and johnny depp's in the room you know wow. <laughs> and uh yeah and um uh, matt, matt leblanc yeah. was another one and and we would all be going for this we knew each other you know from i remember going into this commercial it was for uh cinnamon toast crunch mm-hmm. and i i get there and they're they're telling us we have to sing and dance and i'm like well i'm out yeah and they go, no, you can do this. We, you, know, it doesn't, you don't have to be, look professional. Or, or <laughs> right. I'm like, okay. So they uh-huh. teach us the song. And I still remember it. You sprinkle it light. You sprinkle it right. You spr- uh, sprinkle great taste in every bite of Cinnamon Toast Crunch. You, that's it. You only have that much time and you got to do a little dance. Right. And so uh, I remember uh, 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 Johnny Depp goes in to the room and the door closes behind him and he's in there. Uh, and you can hear him singing. And then 30 seconds later, he comes out and I, and he goes, Mike, you're next. And I'm like, no, I'm not. And I left. <laughs> uh, uh, that was, uh, you didn't want to compete against that. Yeah. I didn't want to compete against that. I, I just didn't, I didn't, I don't know. I, I, I guess I, 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 you know, I could certainly use the money, right? You know that, but I just thought it was ridiculous, and I don't want to be ridiculous, which is a hard thing because actors are yeah. supposed to be a clown, you know. Yeah, are they? Are they supposed to be? I mean, they, they, I mean, they can be in clownish situations, but I don't know. If, I mean, you're an actor. I, I can't say it just doesn't feel like they're. That's I don't see it as that. Part of me resisted a lot of things. Um, like that, you know, when I got onto all my children, see that I can understand, right? And right, and seeing you set other the, careers you set take the off, bar higher for yourself, I think, right? Probably. And seeing these other actors take off because, but I, I got this contract on all my children. I was locked in for like five years, right? And and these other actors that I was working with that I thought I was just as good as or better. Mm-hmm. It's competitive, sure. Um, having great better jobs you know great jobs right. working in film working in nighttime television and and i just thought ah if i just would have waited mm-hmm. i would have landed something else and the stuff that they're giving me is is not fulfilling mm-hmm. you know um and so i think i shot myself in the foot a lot i don't think i behaved well 100 percent of the time i was 23 years old yeah when i first started and I I thought I deserved more, and and um, yeah, I behaved that way. Uh, I would get angry. I would, you know, some of the directors would come up to me and say, "What are you doing?" You know, they would give direction to these other actors, and then they'd pull me aside. Mike, I got to talk to you over here. And they would say, "What What are you doing? What do you mean? What am I doing? I'm I've memorized my lines. I've shown up to work. I'm saying my thing. Yeah, but what are you What are you doing? <laughs> I'm like." That's not direction. Mm. You're a director. Right. Direct to me. Tell me what to do. <laughs> Let's have a conversation there. Well, you need to figure out a way to work. Okay. All right. I don't know what that means, but okay. And yeah. then I would be a mess emotionally. Yeah. And I was away from home. I was away from my um, my, uh, my family and friends and right. anybody that I could confide in about this stuff. It was hard. It was a hard time for me. And then after that, I got Santa Barbara. When that contract was up, they let me go after about three years. And I went back to California. And my agent says, I think you should do another soap opera. I'm like, I don't. I, you know, <laughs> let's do something else. And he's like, no, I think that you'd have a better experience. So I auditioned and got this other part. And it was. It was vastly different. 
and uh, I had it was much better writing. Mm. I thought. I'm sure, that helps a lot. Yeah, but by the time, by the time that was over, I was on the last eighteen months of Santa Barbara before it was um, canceled. It was probably my fault. <laughs> and, of course uh, it was. Yeah, and uh, I decided I was having trouble with. Um, with the fame part of it. With In what famous. aspect? Wanting fame and no. not having enough or having fame and not knowing how to deal with it? The second. Yes. Um, yeah, because Santa Barbara, you're going to get a lot of people watching that. More more people watched All My Children. It was a big one. I mean, they, they would draw 12 million viewers a day. Yeah. Right now on nighttime television, if they're drawing 2 million, that's a, that's a yeah. big audience. Yeah. Television is, is different now. My mom never missed that show for yeah. like 30 years. So I would walk into a supermarket. Oh, it makes sense. And a third of the people in the supermarket would know who I am. Oh, yeah. That's hard. And then by the time I was checking out with my food, they would have told the rest of the people in there. Yeah. And everybody was looking at me. Yeah. And everybody at that time, it was the, the day of autographs. Everybody wanted an autograph. Now it's a selfie. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and which is a lot easier, I think. <laughs> you can get out of there faster. And and I would I would I would slip into my character because that's what they wanted of me. Yeah, of course. You know, I didn't know them from Adam, but I'm in their right. living nice. room every single day. Yeah. No, they know you intimately. Yeah. Yeah. And so I would do that for them and and, and then get out of that situation as quick as I could and go on my way. Uh so I was living this sort of dual existence. Mm. It was a split personality almost. It was mm. strange. And you're young. Yeah. Yeah. I was 27 by the time That's Santa young. Barbara ended. That's young with fame. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I uh, at the end, when, that, when it ended, I wanted to be in charge of my creative life. Mm. Uh, and so I came up with this idea. I bought a 16 millimeter camera and a trailer. And uh, took a few of my friends, one guy who knew how to run the camera, another guy who knew how to record sound. Mm -hmm. And we traveled the United States mm. like Ernie Pyle. Yeah, exactly like Ernie Pyle. Yeah. And um, and I, I suppose that's where I got the idea. I read all of Charles Kuralt's books at that time, mm -hmm. too. I, I just loved the idea of travel, travel writing and whatever. And so the idea was we were going to interview people about the younger generation. Because at that time it was the Pepsi generation commercial came out and mm -hmm. a movie called Reality Bites. I remember and, that very and well. And this sort of hipster concept of this, these you know creative youth who were wrapped up in the fashion of the '50s, '60s, and '70s, who liked music and film, and you know would travel to the Lollapaloozas that were happening all over. You know, and I just wanted to go and record that and see mm. what that was like and we did and i recorded that and i took the time off well first of all what i did is i went into my agent and i had shaved my head and i started growing a beard and i said i'm i'm i quit and as part of the shave the hair grow the beard so people can't recognize that's right it. yeah that's right and uh and so i quit and he thought i was lost it yeah yeah he thought i lost it he's like you you you've taken all this time to build this career and I had contracts on the table to go into nighttime television and I said I need to do this and and I did you're and like 27 28 yeah 27 yeah and so we went out we shot for four or five months we went everywhere spent all my money mm -hmm. came back didn't have enough money to finish the film and what I showed people to try to get the money yeah, to, the to finish it sizzle, they're yeah. like you guys are just drinking beer and smoking <laughs> pot in in yellowstone yeah. you know what do you what is this right you know and i couldn't define it yeah. couldn't, all i had was talking heads interviewed people about what do you think of the younger generation it was sort of the extent of it because we were shooting on film uh -huh. we only had a certain amount of time per reel right so i had to get just right to it and hopefully i got something interesting and now, if you went out, you'd be shooting on a phone, right? And you can let it go for hours, and maybe you <laughs> right. did something interesting. But what happened to all that material? I still have it. Okay, so there's still something there. There is still something there, and I have been working on 
I'm going to turn it into an audio piece. Yeah. I think what is missing is a story in it. So I can tell you the story. I'm okay. Go ahead. It's you. You're the story. It's your journey. You know, it's your searching and trying to find, you know, who you are, why you are, you know, why do you matter? I think that's what it is. Yeah. I think you're right. And that's what I'm doing is I'm finally writing the connective text. Right. And it took you 30 years of reflection to yeah. get there. Yeah. And also, it was my first obsession, this mm. film. And it did, a, it did a number on my mental health, you know, because the, the guilt of sacking your career yeah, I get it. and spending all your money right. um, and, and being f utterly foolish uh, in a lot of ways mm. uh, in, in, the, in trying to make something beautiful, mm. something that matters, mm. something you're in control of, which I didn't have any control over my creative life when I was an actor. Right. Um, and, then, and then nothing happens. And then trying to retain the energy to keep going. What am I going to do today? Who can I call? Who can I, can right. I get some help? Can I, right. maybe I need to shoot more. I'll go, let me, let me buy some more film. And then just throwing money in a hole. Keep, and that eventually, and it took years, uh, a few years, um, where I just had to put it in a closet and then see what's next for my life. Mm. Um, and that was hard. So when you come back, you've done this. Mm. Nobody wants it. In fact, they say it's there's nothing here. Yeah, you're just drinking beer, having fun. Yeah, you, you know, and it's been five months, six months. You know, you still have no hair on the top and a beard. No, you finally you. Go. I think I I got a nice haircut. <laughs> yeah, and then could you find work, or is a, that a little bit, yeah. a little bit? But I also knew that I didn't want to do that. The same thing. Right. I. As a kid, you know, you want to be rich and famous. And, and then you get there, the rich part's fine for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't like, I still don't, you know. And that's the thing that has kept me um, from pursuing it heavily like that. If something ha were to happen now uh, on that level, okay. You can handle it now. I can. Yeah. I can. I don't have to be a part of it. Um but, but it, it, it all that would mean is that um, I'm in a in a place where my stories are being told, right? And people are paying for it. Yes, that's great. You know that's terrific. But uh, but if it doesn't happen, I'm totally satisfied doing what I'm doing, and I'm constantly because I'm constantly creating every day. Yeah, that's right. I'm writing every day. Yeah, I'm doing. So, yeah, I think that's the ultimate lesson, and I suppose that would probably be the final chapter of. The audio piece when I put together all, I got so much audio of interviews. Yeah, I mean, who knows? <clears throat> it has to be audio and video, I would think, too, just because you have all this great video. You have all this great film. I don't, I'm not going to, I don't know. Maybe. Oh, yeah. But, ah, gosh, it's so much. It would be it's wonderful too. if you could actually go back and find any of these people that you interviewed and re-interview them. Yeah. You know, this is 30 years difference yeah. right yeah 1993 yeah 31 years 30 years yeah 30 years a long time yeah i mean it's a lot of energy but it almost sounds like it would be cathartic yeah to do this kind of yeah journey. it's like uh, herman hess um journey to the east you ever read that no where he had he had gotten together with some people on a project and they abandoned it and he wanders for the rest of his life, mm -hmm. loose, free, not doing anything, trying not to become obsessed with another project of some sort. <laughs> and they had an argument with that, with that group, and they all went their separate ways. And then what he finds out 30 years later is that, uh, or 30, I don't know if it's 30, um, that a week later the, the rest of that team came together and finished the project, and he didn't. And the regrets, mm. you know, and I think about that. Yeah, but, it needs to. It needs to end. Yeah, I'm sure you've been thinking about it for decades. You're a wizard. You got that story out of me. That's crazy. Yeah, but it's true. I can see it. 
Yeah. You know, it's an it's a real thing. It's an emotional. It's very emotional. It's very deep. Of you. Yeah. And now I'm obsessed with this pile thing. Now I can. Yeah, I get it. Well, mm-hmm. I think you relate to him. Yeah. You know, I mean, you did the same journey before you really well, yeah. you knew him, but you really didn't. Yeah. You know, you do the, your journey at 27, you figure him out at 24, but, you know, I mean, you've come full circle for sure. Yeah. His, his despising of fame is a huge thing for me. I, I'm, I connect with him on that for sure. On his way out to the Pacific, when, where he died, um, he stopped in Hollywood mm. because they were making the story of G.I. Joe which was his story. <laughs> wow. And Burgess Meredith was playing yes, him. Yes, yes. And uh, he, there are photos of Ernie Pyle and Burgess Meredith on the set before he... Ships out to Okinawa, mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. he doesn't really want to go. Yeah, yeah. And he doesn't really want to be on set. He had a lot of friends in Hollywood, and he liked hanging out with them and partying with them and, and all of that, but he, he just despised being famous. And I think that's part of what he knew he was coming back to. Um, he was coming back to his wife who w- had just fallen into really mm. the depths of mental illness and despair. Right. Knowing, knowing that he was coming back to that. Discovering for himself that she was living with PTSD mm. her whole life and he never understood it. He always thought, get over it. You know, and that's that's the simple remedy. Just yeah. Buck up. Get Classic over it. For that time, right? right. And now he's gone through war and he has seen death, what he calls mo- uh, death in monstrous infinity, mm. which was in the dispatch that he was writing when he, they found on his body. It was in pencil in his pocket. And he was preparing the dispatch about the end of the war um, in the Pacific coming up because they were in, he was killed on an island off of Okinawa. Right. And uh, and so he knew he was coming back to that fame that he didn't want. Yeah, with a movie coming out, it's mm-hmm. basically about to, his character, right? To his to his wife and her issues, major problems, and understanding that the PTSD that he has um, collected, accrued, uh, that has occurred to him, happened to him, uh, is he he's lived with it so much with his wife. And seeing how she's dealt with hers, that he knows what's coming for himself. Mm-hmm. And a lot of other American men. And the, the state that the country might be in. And so he was out and about on an island. taking. He, they took sniper fire. Right. And he was in a jeep with a colonel. And they jumped into a ditch. Yeah. And they were waiting for the for the AOK that they can come up that they got the sniper. And Ernie sticks his head up and he got shot. He got killed. Yeah. Right underneath his helmet, right? And I wonder what was on his mind. I wonder he's looking at the face of all of that that he's yeah. coming back to. The war's ending and he knows it. Yeah. It's hard to know what it was. It's a beautiful story. Yeah. It's a fascinating yeah. story. And it solidifies his fame. <laughs> Which is odd because he doesn't want it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know? And then he died. He died four days after Roosevelt. Yeah. And his death usurped the death of the presidents and the the power of that in yeah. the, the minds of America. People were utterly distraught about it. Well, and you have Roosevelt, who's been the guiding father, and then yes. you have Pyle, who's mm-hmm. the voice of their. Family, friends, brothers, yep. husbands, yep. and then they die hmm. within four days of each other. Is that what you four days of each other. Yeah, that's a big, hard, huge hit. Hit, really hard. Yeah. Followed up by the atomic bomb not too long after that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that had to be a tough time for America. Tough, but at the same time, the war ends and yeah, then we start our generation. Yeah, I can't imagine what it was like over there. No, I don't think uh, you can unless uh, you talk overseas to... or any of that, or or even what life was like here in this country. You know, imagine being four F, and all the other men, yeah, in your in the in your country are going to war, yeah, and doing their part. Imagine that guilt, um, losing somebody, 
Yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, the destruction uh, that, ha that happened to Europe. I, I, I really... Or being Jewish. Or being Jewish. <laughs> being yeah. Jewish right now. I mean, just, yeah, all that. I mean, just... Mm -hmm. it's, it was a difficult time for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I encourage anybody to pick up Brave Men and read it or listen to the audiobook uh, because it really, really gives you an idea of what life was like for soldiers over there that a movie, that all the great movies can't do. Mm -hmm. Because there's only one thing that a war movie does. There's only one theme, and that is war is hell. Mm -hmm. That's it. They all say the same thing. We're all attracted to them and watch them, and we like adventure movies and whatnot. But that's what they say. This says something else. This, or Brave Men, says something about the heart of people. Mm. Yeah, because he's at the base of that. He's talking to all these people, and he's living it. Yeah. He's right there. He's eating with them and suffering with them, and mm -hmm. you know he understands all of that. Yeah. Mm. I can see why you picked him. <laughs> There's a lot there. It's a, it's yeah. a deep well for exploration for sure yeah yeah anything else we need to share with the world anything you're doing that you want to know i mean we've got your project that you're going to be doing your 30-year project that we've talked about yes today. <laughs> i gotta get to that I'm, i have another project that i'm working with uh, amanda marsh oh. uh we recorded all the sound for that and it's her writing mm -hmm. she is the wife of of eric marsh who led the granite mountain hot shots Oh, in, yeah. In Prescott, yeah. Uh, out of Prescott, Arizona. The uh, Yarnell Fire of 2013. Yes. 19 firefighters were killed. Yes. Her yeah. husband was one of them. Yes. And she is a, a farrier and a horse person. Yes. And she rescues horses up in Prescott. And she is an incredible writer. When, when we were up, Danuta and I and my wife, we were up in uh, at the Fippin Show in, in Prescott last, uh, last June. Uh, Amanda came into Danuta's booth and they started talking and they had a great time. You can get the story from Danuta. She'll tell you. But lo and behold, we were invited out to her house and we were talking because she bought a painting of Danuta's. And uh, she told me she's a writer and, and whatnot. And I said, I'd love to read your stuff. And I did. And I read the, and it was like Cormac McCarthy. Yeah. She starts out with a, the opening line is about her cutting her thumb and blood spurting. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> you this is no holes barred mm. you don't give a fart about the audience right you're you're gonna go for it she's a she's a true pioneer type of person you know a western real western mm. gritty person mm -hmm. and uh and she and it shows out in her writing and it was super powerful and i'm like have you ever thought about doing an audio piece with this and that's what we're doing and so it's her book, basically. It is. It is. We're, we're separating it, separating it by chapters. Mm. She calls them essays. Mm -hmm. And then we'll string them together in a season of probably thinking about 16 episodes. And mm. each one is about 20, 20 minutes long. But we will apply. I, I, I recorded wild sound of her cleaning a horses, of her, of her talking. Right. Um, and just the sounds of, of her, where she lives out there in the, uh, in the, in the shadow of Granite Mountain. She lives right at the base of Granite Mountain. And, uh, and so all of that stuff will lay in there like an audio doc, mm -hmm. you know, and we'll do music and we'll mm -hmm. try to make some cr good creative decisions, and not mm -hmm. get in the way of, of her voice. Cause she's, she did her own, uh, reading of her own material. And so we won't get in the way of that, but we'll try to be additive, you know, with the soundscapes and stuff. So. And you've done all, all the recordings. We of, did the recording. Yeah. yeah. So now you're putting it together. I am. Yeah. So yeah. when will that come out? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how long this stuff takes um, like this for a piece like this. But I'm hoping sometime in the first couple of months of 2024. Yeah, that's cool. But uh, I'll let you know. Absolutely. Well, okay. Deborah Coburn and Havel Fellows did the sculpture for that. Oh yeah. yeah, is that who it was? Yeah, they're still having a problem up there getting it up there, aren't they? I don't know, because it's not this. The, the base is there uh, yeah. in the courthouse square, but the statue's not there. Yeah, 
it could be a foundry issue. I, well, I saw it actually. Danuta and I, we yeah. we saw them at it, it was um, John Coleman's old studio mm. in Prescott, and there's a foundry there now. Yeah. And oh, they, so it was at the foundry. It was at the foundry. It was yeah. outside, and we're driving by, and we're like, oh, my gosh, there it is, shiny silver yeah. before it was patinaed. Yeah. Somebody's out there with a rasp and yeah. uh-huh. yep. spit shining it. And, uh, and we went, and we were. they called us over because we're on the other side of the street standing there. Oh, my gosh, that's uh-huh. – and uh, they called us over, and we got to tour the foundry. It was so cool. But knowing it was John Coleman's original you know, studio like that, that was pretty special. Now your book, by the way, that you did, the Ernie Pyle, it also, it also got an award, right? It came in second for the uh, oh oh the 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 audio the drama, podcast. yeah, yeah. We we it was an, an audio award. The audio awards is the big award of the year, right? Is, That's the one. It's like the Academy Awards for audio right pieces and whatnot. And yeah, we were up against. Uh, well, we lost to BBC Radio's Doctor Who. Yeah, hard. The bastards. Yeah. <laughs> but how do you beat them? You yeah. Know? But but it was an um, incredible honor right out of the gate to have them notice it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I want to throw that in there because this is really thank you. You know, it's a you know award winning recognized podcast. I really yeah. enjoy. I haven't heard it all. You know, I started it and I finished. Uh, I think I'm on number four right now. Yeah. So it's a good arc of character. I tried to show an arc of character of the of of his wife. Yes. She carries the story. She does carry it. Yeah. From what I've heard so far. Yeah. 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 And then to be able to read Ernie's pieces in there, I think that that's a, yeah. that's like a, a you know, getting a ringer, yeah. hiring uh, Barry <laughs> Bonds to come right. out and play on your softball team. Yeah. What do you think you would think of this anyway, Ernie Pyle? What do you think you would think of what you I think about that all the time. Yeah. Um, part of me doesn't care. Because I'm trying to do what I want to do. Right. I, I I'm I'm writing more than just about them. Mm-hmm. I'm putting in, like every artist does. Is, there's things about my own life in there. Of course, it has to be, or it won't be good. Right. Right. I mean, we've all had, you know, bouts, or we we all have people in our families and friends who have who have battled mental illness and PTSD and. Um, and different things. And so that's what, for me, is going into uh, this story mm. for me. I'm writing about, not about Jerry, I'm writing about people close to me, mm. really. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so because of that, I I know that, you know, if Ernie and Jerry were re- able to read my stuff, they would say, well, we weren't like that at all. Right. I know that, you know. I just hope that they wouldn't be angry and burn the whole thing down. No, they wouldn't. I doubt it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just trying to write well. Yeah. So. You're a writer. Yeah. That's what you do. Well, you're multifaceted. But that's, I see that as being your strongest suit as of this moment. Mm. That's, that's really where you're, it feels like that's really kind of where your heart is. You know? Is to, yeah, it is right now. Yeah. That's what it feels like. I can relate to it being a writer myself. So yeah. it's like, a, yeah, I can go, oh, yeah, I feel the same thing. <laughs> well, Mike, thank you so much. Uh, where can people find you, by the way? Is there? Um, I, you know, I I don't have a website, but you know, I am on Instagram and Facebook. What's your Instagram? Michael Brainerd. Uh, my Instagram is uh, Mickey, as in Mickey Mouse. Mickey underscore the underscore brain. B r a i n. Mickey the brain. Mickey underscore the underscore brain. Okay, that's and, Instagram. That's Instagram, and I have most of my what I post there are um, photos of my woodworking, really. But yeah. you can get a hold of me there. Yeah, and uh, the podcast for the uh, Ernie Pyle Experiment. It's everywhere. Just do a Google search, and yeah. it'll bring you right to the WFIU Indiana radio station, where yeah. it's it's all available. It's for free. I just put in Ernie Pyle, and it came up under my yeah for Buzzsprout. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like okay, there it is. Click, boom. Cost you nothing. It's yeah. like, I get this for free. That doesn't seem quite right. <laughs> See, that's what I was thinking. It's like, wow, you get, I don't have to pay anything for this. Yeah. So, but, that's, yeah. but I guess nobody has to pay anything for this either. So I, I'm also on the board of the National Audio Theater Festival. Okay. So you can get a hold of me through that website. And uh, I'm producing, helping to produce some other things through that as well. Huh? You're busy. You got a lot going on. Yeah. 
Uh-huh. It's good. No time for acting other than the audio uh-huh. acting. Yeah. Well, if somebody wants to hire me as an actor. Yeah. I'm, I'm available. Let's see. Could you do Maynard Dixon? Yeah, you probably could, actually. Yeah, you'd Maynard? Be, yeah, you'd be the, a little oh, older one, gosh. but couldn't be the young man. He's a... I would love to. Gosh, what a what a life. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a this is, this is a deep well there too. Yeah. Danuta and I we were just up at the his atelier up in Utah. Yeah. This that's, last summer. Yeah, that's wonderful. Oh my gosh, it's yeah. beautiful. I want to recreate that. I want to rebuild the whole compound somewhere. <laughs> for myself. <Where? laughs> I know. Uh, anywhere. Anywhere. <laughs> All right. Well I'm gonna do your wife's uh audio oh, cool. uh, you know podcast next so yeah i appreciate you guys coming down and letting me talk to you I really well enjoy yeah it. mark it's it's like i said i love listening to and learning a lot about uh the, the art world through your podcast and we love coming here this is a beautiful gallery thank you every single time we come in i'm absolutely inspired by everything i see thank you so uh yeah here's right. to it was fun it was let's go do the next one great thanks <laughs> that's great mike thanks